Your end, which is endless, is as a snowflake dissolving in the pure air. The murder of Robert Wan. On August 2nd, 2006, 32-year-old Robert Eric Wan, a both highly accomplished and successful individual and lawyer, living in suburban Oakton in Virginia with his wife Catherine, had just finished working late as the general counsel at Radio Free Asia in downtown Washington, D.C. Anticipating working late that particular evening, Wan had pre-arranged staying overnight at the home of his longtime friend Joseph Price. Price, along with his partner Victor Zaborski, co-owned a prestigious home located within the city. Also living with the couple was Dylan Ward, where all three men lived in a polyamorous relationship with one another, as a family. At approximately 10.20pm, after calling his wife to say goodnight, Mr. Wan then called to inform Mr. Price of his due arrival, soon arriving at the residence at approximately 10.30pm. All four gentlemen spoke in the kitchen area for a while, before retiring to their bedrooms for the evening at approximately 11pm. Sometime between 11 to 11.35pm, a next-door neighbour later reported hearing what he described as a desperate scream coming from within their neighbour's home. At 11.49pm, a panicked Victor Zaborski made a 911 call. What you are about to hear are clips taken from that 911 call. DC emergency 911 operator 6752. Do you need police, fire, or ambulance? Me, me, please. We need an ambulance. What's wrong, ma'am? We just, uh, we had someone that was in our house, evidently, and they stabbed somebody. Okay, somebody's inside the house now? I don't know, we heard. Are they bleeding? You see someone yes, bleeding? Someone is bleeding in our house. Okay, where's they bleeding from? Uh, I think he was. I think in the stomach. In the stomach? Is he conscious? Uh, Calm down for me. I'm going to send some help, okay? Female or male? It's a male. He's a friend of ours. He was, spent, he was spending the night with us. Okay. And who was the person that stabbed him? Do you know? Is, he, is, is he conscious? We need an ambulance. Ma'am, listen to me. He's not conscious. He's not conscious at all? No. We need someone right now. Is he breathing? Listen, listen to me. Calm down. I'm going to help you. Okay. Is he breathing? I'm upstairs and he's downstairs. I don't know. <laughs> and it's 15, ma'am, calm down. 1509 Swan Street, Northwest. Am I correct? Yes, it is. The person that says him, is he still in the home? I don't know. Within five minutes of the call, at 11.54 p.m., paramedics arrived at the residence followed by police soon after. Upon arrival, however, they were met with an unusual scene. All three men appeared to be freshly showered and were reported to be acting surprisingly calm, which was a far cry from that of the emotional state heard during the 911 call. Directed to the guest bedroom located on the second floor of the home, paramedics were faced with the body of Robert Wan on the bed. The scene was described by paramedics as very wrong. According to court papers, paramedics went on to state, quote, It looked like his abdomen had been wiped, kind of like when you wash a window. I saw a large hole in the victim's chest, big enough to fit your finger into, but there was no blood whatsoever on the victim, on the floor or anywhere in the room. To the paramedics, it appeared that Wone had been stabbed, showered, redressed and placed on the bed. On top of the bedside cabinet lay Mr. Wan's undisturbed belongings, as well as a bloody knife, which Price later claimed he had placed there upon initially discovering it laying on the stomach of Wan's deceased body. The room appeared clean, with little blood on or around the victim, which was very odd given the severity of the injuries sustained. One was wearing a t-shirt and shorts, of which was his regular bedwear, and laying on his bed with his hands by his side and the bed neatly laid beneath his body. One was rushed to George Washington University Hospital, where he was pronounced dead at 12.24am on August 3rd. Forensics ran multiple tests and concluded the following. The body possessed no defensive wounds. The bloody knife discovered on the bedside table was not the murder weapon. A toxicology report determined that no drugs or alcohol were present in one's bloodstream. 
semen belonging to the victim was found both on his genitals and within his anus. An in-depth search of the home, spanning over three weeks, revealed a large assortment of sadomasochistic sex toys, bondage devices and homosexual paraphernalia. Amongst the collection was a device known as a milking machine, which is used for masturbatory practices to aid or force one's ejaculation. Detectives found it hard to believe that an intruder had entered the home without forced entry, entered one's bedroom, carried out the murder and escaped without detection. They began to theorise that one's death had been sexually motivated and that Price, Zaborski and Ward played a much bigger role in his death. They intensely interrogated all three, but their stories remained consistent. Zaborski claimed that upon the discovery of one's body, he had let out a scream of shock, which was corroborated by the neighbour's testimony. Due to any evidence against the men being purely circumstantial and not directly linking either of them to the crime, detectives could not arrest them on suspicion of one's murder. Later, all men would be arrested on obstruction of justice charges, as well as conspiracy charges, but would later be acquitted of all charges. The affidavit, filed by authorities supporting their arrest warrant, showed that investigators had concluded the men were not telling the truth about what happened. The report states, quote, The evidence demonstrates that Robert Wan was restrained, incapacitated, sexually assaulted and murdered inside 1509 Swan Street, and there exists overwhelming evidence far in excess of probable cause, that Price, Zaborski and Ward obstructed justice by altering and orchestrating the crime scene, planting evidence, delaying the reporting of the murder to the authorities and lying to the police about the true circumstances of the murder. Over 12 years have passed since the murder of Robert Eric Wan took place, and still detectives have no further leads or evidence leading to the identity of his killer or killers. This bizarre case remains unsolved. It's so much darker when a light goes out than it would have been if it had never shone. The disappearance of Nicholas Barclay. Born on December 31st, 1980 in San Antonio, Texas, to mother Beverly Dollahide, Nicholas Patrick Barclay was the youngest in his family with an older half-brother and sister, Jason and Carrie Gibson. Energetic and rebellious in nature, Nicholas was regarded as quite a handful growing up. He was occasionally physically and verbally abusive towards his mother and siblings, to such an extent that police had been called to the house to calm him down on multiple occasions. This aggression continued in school, where Nicholas was often in trouble with teachers and frequently truant. His rebel attitude resulted in a juvenile criminal record, having stolen a pair of shoes, threatened one of his teachers and broken into a convenience store. In an attempt to gain control of the situation, Nicholas's uncle had moved into the residence, but this done little to influence his nephew. By age 13, Nicholas had three illegal tattoos carved into his skin and would frequently disappear for days at a time without informing his family before returning home. His juvenile record had earned him a sentencing hearing scheduled for June 14, 1994, at which he was likely to be sent to a rehabilitative group home for troubled teens. Nicholas would never attend his sentencing hearing. In the early evening of June 13, 1994, Nicholas had just finished playing basketball with his friends and called home from a nearby payphone to ask his mother to pick him up. His mother, exhausted from working all night the previous day, was asleep and his older brother Jason refused to wake her up, instructing his little brother to walk home. Nicholas would not return home that evening. Police initially assumed that Nicholas simply ran away to avoid his juvenile court hearing the following day and due to his past history of disappearances, they showed little haste in regards to his whereabouts. Police had also established that Nicholas had only had $5 on his person at the time of his disappearance, so couldn't have gone far. Authorities figured it wouldn't be too long before they spotted him. He didn't have a change of clothes with him, and he'd left home wearing purple pants and carrying a pink backpack. Police were convinced they'd find him in no time, yet days turned into weeks without a clue or glimpse of Nicholas. 
Three months later, on September 25th, San Antonio police received a call from Nicholas's older brother Jason, reporting that someone had attempted to break into the family's garage. What made the incident so peculiar, however, was that Jason was almost certain that the intruder was his missing younger brother Nicholas. Police promptly responded to the report and intensively combed the neighbourhood for Nicholas, to no avail. With no leads to his whereabouts, it seemed as though the case of missing Nicholas Barclay had gone completely cold. That was until three years later, in October of 1997, when San Antonio police received a call from a man working in a youth shelter in Linares, Spain, who had both terrifying and amazing news. He claimed that he had in fact discovered Nicholas Barkley alive. He told police that he had discovered the boy huddled up in a phone box. He had escaped a child sex ring operation run by high-ranking European political and military officials. He stated that the abuse the young teen had endured had left him with little memory, but he was relatively healthy and had even learned French, as well as the basics of a few other European languages. Shocked but overcome with intense relief, Nicholas's older half-sister Carrie Gibson flew to Spain right away in order to identify her alleged brother. When she arrived at the youth shelter, the boy remained in his room, afraid to see her in case she wouldn't recognise him. However, upon seeing him for the first time, Carrie eagerly identified him as her younger brother Nicholas. Overwhelmed with excitement, Carrie sat with her long-lost brother and looked through dozens of family photos in hopes of jogging his memory. But as previously told by police, he had forgotten almost everything due to his horrific ordeal. However, as Carrie continued to probe and prompt Nicholas, fragments of his memory began to return. Authorities then orchestrated a test that they felt would offer definitive proof that the individual was in fact who he had been claiming to be. It was arranged for family photographs, of which he had never seen before, but taken of family members he should be able to identify, to be shown to him for positive identification. Of the ten pictures presented, nine were positively identified. With only a single mistake made, Nicholas was free to return home to his family in San Antonio. Nicholas's return was met with immediate scepticism by fellow relatives. Although his mother Beverly was overjoyed and adamant that the person was in fact her son, relatives couldn't help but draw attention to particular inconsistencies. The once blue-eyed boy now possessed dark brown eyes. His hair had darkened, so too had his skin complexion, and he now spoke with a French accent. In counter to these changes, he claimed his abductors had chemically altered his hair and eye colour, and that he had picked up different speech patterns from living in Europe for so long. The family was split, and eventually asked for both a blood test and fingerprint analysis to be performed. Nicholas refused to provide such samples. He re-enrolled into school and attempted to continue with his life as best he could, but the accusations and speculation surrounding his identity had captivated the public. With help from the media attention and a sceptical private investigator, Charlie Parker, a court ordered fingerprints and DNA testing be carried out contrary to Nicholas's mother's wishes. The test conclusively proved that the individual was not Nicholas Barclay, but instead 23-year-old French-born Frédéric Boudin. Boudin was a serial imposter, assuming the identities of over 500 missing individuals, earning the nickname The Chameleon. He claims that his loveless childhood was to blame for his crimes. He done it for nothing more than attention and psychological pleasure. Consequently, Bedeen was charged with passport fraud and perjury in the San Antonio court system and sentenced to six years in prison. During his incarceration, authorities began to focus their investigation on Nicholas's family in their attempt to generate leads on his disappearance, but to no avail. To this day, the case of the disappearance of Nicholas Barclay remains unsolved.